Uh, do you feel like you're getting a grasp of what Joshua is all about? You, you have some idea of what it's all about, where he fits in the matter of Bible history? Moses gets the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt, and Joshua is the one who takes them into the promised land. And so uh, we've tried to, uh, to survey the book of Joshua and sort of looking at, uh, at the individual chapters a- a- as we went through all of this. We've, we, we've talked about Joshua crossing over the Jordan River, and we're leaving out some of the things that are there, and some of you are straining like you cannot see it. And so uh, uh, if you want to, just look around over your left shoulder or over your right shoulder, and you may be able to see it better over here. I'm not sure. But you don't even have to have that. But that's, that's sort of the outline by chapter. I've passed out this outline before, and you may have, have that, uh, you may have that with you. Joshua helps him to cross over the Jordan. And then there's those memorial stones that they erected, one in the middle of the Jordan and the other one over on the, uh, on the west bank of the Jordan. And uh, those are important. And we spent a lot of time that Wednesday night. We talked about that. We need to put memorials in our lives for our children. And that's, that is so, so important. Uh, there ought to be things that happen in our lives that are spiritual reminders to our children. Just things that happen. Well, we always did this, you know. Uh, uh, I remember as a child, Saturday night was bath night. I'm not sure if I took baths other ni- every other night, but I remember Saturday night was bath night. You had to have, and that's get your shoes ready tomorrow Sunday. That's really important. And that little card class we had there at West Huntsville, Dan, do you know your memory verse? And my answer is, what memory verse? And I mean, that was, uh, uh, but though, you see, that's, that, that's a memory. I think about that. I remember my grandmother, when I'd been, spend the night over there, she was in charge of putting the grape juice in the cups. And she also was in charge of making the, the, the communion bread. And uh, she'd always make a little bit extra. And, uh, of course, in church you don't get that stuff. And, uh, but Saturday night, at, you know, at Mama's house, she'd just take a little cup. Now, Dan, this is your cup. Every time you see grape juice in here, you can have this. And she'd start filling up cups, and I'd lose attention. And all of a sudden I'd look down, my cup's full. And, I, you know, and, and so I'd get that cup full. And then uh, she said, now there's some bread here. I've got one extra piece. And, uh, you know, you can, you, can, you can have this if you want it. And so... Uh, Saturday night was snack time. I don't know if that's, if that's proper or not. It is, it's a memorial my grandmother gave me. And we need to do that for our children. It needs to be the kind of thing that's always a part of our life. They cross over the Jordan. They go take Jericho. And you remember what happened at Ai because of Achan's sin. You remember how he stole some of those uh, things from Jericho. And, uh, and they, 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 uh, they stoned Jericho. Stoned his family and, uh, you know, took all of his possession and killed the, whatever things were moving evidently. They stoned them some way or another. And then they took all of his possession and pot, put a pile of rocks on top of them. That's rem- By the way, that pile of rocks is a memorial also. It's one of a different kind, but it is a memorial that's there. You could not walk by the, 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 where that pile of rocks was without thinking, man, there's a lesson from God right here. And Hosea says that that thing that happened in the valley of Achor is a, was a memorial. Uh, uh, not what was a memorial, but said it's the place of hope. If you want to have hope in the day of in the in the book of Hosea for that northern kingdom, you'd better go back to Achor and recognize you've got to deal with sin. And that was the only hope that they had. And then we talked about the battles of, that were fought in the conquering first of southern Palestine and then of the northern Palestine. Uh, we spent time looking last week at the long list of kings. Anybody remember exactly how many kings Joshua, uh, Joshua captured? More than 12. Anybody want to say another number? What if I say less than 32? Would that help? Would you like to guess if I say less than 32? 31. We have some brilliant Bible students here, all right? And uh, you've got to keep in mind that I'm a trickster, so that might not, not be a clue the next time I ask that question. But that's 31 battles. I mean, you start talking about conquering the promised land. It, you know, you don't do, do that overnight. I read somewhere today that it might have taken as long as seven years to conquer the promised land. And I don't know how anybody came up with that number, but somebody came up with it. And uh, um, uh, the Bible, as far as I know, does not give any indication of that. And then, uh, then, then we talked about the charge of Joshua to go out and to, and to finish taking the land. And, and so then, then after that, 
we talked about the, the division of the land and how it was divided among the tribes. And this is the kind of thing we talked about last week. I said I had a map that was there, and this, this map's probably a whole lot better. You can see it's color coordinated, and you may have a map, a map in the back of your Bible. I would encourage you to uh, not just read the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, but read it Genesis to maps. And uh, it, it, it will help you understand some things. They got into the promised land, and each of the tribes had, had their own possessions, and it was divided out. And I love this map because it's pretty, color, pretty well color-coded. Some of the maps in the back of the Bible I don't like as much. They'll have the same information. And uh, these boundary lines are variable in relationship uh, uh, to, uh, to, to some of these. But the Lord says, I've, I've promised you this land. And, uh, and, and so I just put the verses down from Joshua chapter 14. There's those first three verses. These are the territories which the sons of Israel inherited in the land of Canaan. And then he says, Eleazar the priest and Joshua the son of Nun and the heads of the households of the tribes of the sons of Israel apportioned to them for an inheritance. And so they all get together and so each of the tribes, now that the land has been conquered, the land is divided out among them. And so uh, we, we've talked about that, but I, I, I think that graphic really helps me grab a hold of it. I'm not sure if you're a visual person or not, but I can read those words on the page, and I guess I use vision to do that, but I don't get a picture. But with something like this, I, I, I get an idea of, of when we talk about two and a half tribes being on the east bank of the Jordan, and, and that darker color down uh, at the bottom, I think, is the tribe of Reuben, and then uh, above that, I think, is the tribe of Manasseh, and the above that is the tribe of Gad, or did I, I think I may have reversed those two. Uh, but uh, th that, that's where they were. And then last week, we spent a lot of time talking about cities of refuge. Uh, if you accidentally killed somebody. Now, if you didn't accidentally kill somebody, eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, and a life for a life. And so the next of kin had the right to bring vengeance uh, on you uh, if you had killed uh, uh, some, some individual. So the next of kin had that right. Now, he should have done it through the judicial system that was there, but uh, uh, sometimes that man, life or a life, is going to go get him, even if it happened accidentally. So that, that Jew who had accidentally killed somebody went to the cities of refuge. And uh, the next slide is, is probably the most confusing slide I have ever made. And I almost did this different and everything. But there are, there are six cities that are there. And so the Bible talks about Kedish. And Kedish is right there where that dot is, up in that northern part of, the, uh, of, the, uh, uh, of Israel. And then he mentions Shechem. And Shechem is right here in what we would know as Samaria, uh, there's a dot there, and so they'll give you some idea of, of where that was. And then down at the bottom is, is the place called Hebron, and uh, he, Hebron is a, was, a, was one of the cities of refuge. And so on the, on the west bank of the Jordan River, these places were far enough, and Richard, was you, were you the one who last week said it was about a day's journey? So, so you would be able to, uh, to, uh, uh, to, to get to that place. And when you got into, the, into that city, there was a trial that was held. And I don't, I don't mean a trial by jury, but there was a, a hearing that was given and the elders of the city made the decision as to whether it was accidental or not. And if it was accidental, then you were safe as long as you stayed inside that city of refuge. And it tells us something about the justice and the mercy of God, you know. Some of our laws in America are based on, uh, on this Old Testament. I'm actually amazed to look back to the original laws uh, written by our, our forefathers in relationship to this country. How many of them are pretty much the same? You read the one, and so uh, we talk about a Judeo-Christian nation. Uh, that's, that's where that comes from. When they're, when they're trying to frame the Constitution and, and some of the laws of retribution were, uh, in, in, in the various states are identical about how much penalty was to be paid for this and in what circumstances penalties were to be paid. And then on the other side uh, of this is, uh, is Kedesh. Well, the Kedesh is there. Is, um, uh, what is that? Is that's, that's Golan up, in, up, up there. 
And then right here is uh, Ramoth in Gilead. And down at, the, down at the bottom here is a place called Bezer. One, and those are just three cities on either side there. And uh, as long as you stayed inside the city, you were safe. Uh, however, if you wandered outside the city, you might get in trouble because the avenger might still be outside of that and it was only a city of refuge and if you got outside the city, you were liable for, uh, 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 you know, well, you, were, you could be put to death. That's a better way of saying that. How long did the man who accidentally killed someone, how long was his sentence? How long did he have to stay inside the city of refuge? Till the high priest died. And so they'd have Saturday night prayer meetings praying for the death of the, the high priest. I made that up, but, uh, but uh, you know, anybody seen the high priest? How's he looking? You know, I mean, uh, you, you, isn't your cousin high priest? How's he looking? I, I'm making all of that up and everything. But that's sort of a normal reaction, kind of the reaction I'd have if I were in there. Now then, if after that time the high priest dies, you're a free man. And you go outside, if the avenger is there, uh, he can no longer, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. I mean, he, he can no longer because you're no longer guilty. It was an accidental slaying. The Bible says this is, these are the rules about that. And now that the high priest is dead, and that's the rule about that, you are innocent. And so uh, if, if he were to kill you, then he, would, he himself would, be, uh, uh, would, would become the target uh, uh, that, that there would be. The, the other thing that we perhaps need to look at is the cities of the Levites. And that's, uh, that's in, in chapter 21. Now, I don't know if you want to open up your Bible there, but uh, can, can anyone find that verse in chapter 21 that tells um, um, how, many cities of, how many cities of the Levites were there? Now, while you're looking for that, where's the tribe of Levi? And when we look back at that chart before, where's the tribe of Levi? They had no land possession at all. And while the others had geographical boundaries, and if you think about geographical boundaries being like county lines or something like that, I mean, they're, they're laid out. They're all one nation, but they're, they're, there's boundaries in relationship to that. But the Levites had no boundaries at all. And, and so um, uh, chapter 21 says that uh, it would be better if I got in the book, of, uh, uh, the book of Joshua instead of the book of Deuteronomy. I think I might be more likely to find what, I, what I'm looking for in, in relationship to this. Uh, did anybody know what verse it is that tells how many cities that were given? Uh, what verse is it? All right. And the, and the number of the cities was what? Forty-eight cities, that's in verse 41. Forty-eight cities with their common lands. Now the common lands would be that land that just lay outside the city. But the Levites were supported by the tithe. And that's something sometimes we overlook. Uh, it was not money given to uh, keep the temple or the tabernacle in business. That's not where it came from. That tithe belonged to the Levites. Now listen to this. It was God's purpose when these Levites were scattered in the, in, oh, pardon me, in, in, uh, I got, let me just go ahead and get this map here, it, that whenever the Levites were scattered all over in this area, it was God's purpose and design for them to be the teachers of the law. And that's important for us to remember. How on earth will a nation where very few people might read or where, where there might be many who were illiterate, how, are they on, how on earth are they going to know what the will of God is? Whenever the priest stopped preaching the truths of God, immorality took over. Truths of God, thou shalt not make unto thyself any graven image. That's not hard to understand. But the people who might have been Ill illiterate might have forgotten that. And so whenever the priest stopped being the messengers of God, and I don't mean inspired messengers of God, they just took the law of God and it was their responsibility to teach the people the Old Testament. And whenever they failed in that, then all of a sudden the nation became so corrupt 
Have you ever known of any corruption that ever came from the pulpits in America? You know, is there any chance that perhaps in the pulpits of our lands there might be a situation where the pulpits of our land might have failed to do the will of God? Yes, I think so. I mentioned this recently, and I don't have Tim's permission, but it was, but uh, uh, Tim Cox, I don't think Tim is here, but I'm going to take advantage of him and uh, I don't think I need his permission to tell you what he wrote me. His brother is a preacher in the Lutheran Church. Tim's brother is a preacher. And the Lutheran Church faced this matter of homosexuality. And so the hierarchy of the Lutheran Church gets together and they send out a a 51-page document about what the official position of the Lutheran Church is. Now, in the first place, the whole concept of a hierarchy of of learned men or not so learned men ever getting together to decide what truth is, is wrong. They don't have that kind of authority. All authority has been given unto me in heaven and in earth. And and, and when the Bible says for us to be subject to the elders, the elders don't have legislative authority. All authority that belongs to, belongs, uh, to, to the Lord Jesus. And, and that Greek word for that kind of authority, and you don't have to remember this, is exousia. All exousia belongs to Jesus Christ. Now, you go and you teach, you baptize, and you teach people to observe whatever I said. And so those apostles, when they went out, they did not have exousia authority. They just did not have the authority to decide what's right and what's wrong because all exousia belongs to Jesus Christ. And when any, any group of men, when any pastor or, or if elders were to do that, when they, when they are ready to give uh, rules that God has not given, they don't have the right to do that. Now, elders have a responsibility and we have a responsibility to be subject to them, but not in doctrinal matters. Elders don't decide doctrine, and yet denominations all over this land are struggling with this matter of of homosexuality. And uh, it's going to be real interesting to see how it all falls out. So Tim, as as the, I'm not sure what they call the preachers in the Lutheran church, gets this document, and the the church is aware that the document has come out, uh, and when Tim's brother gets this document, His brother reads it, and Tim's observation, he said, he showed it to me. And here's here's, here's Tim's remark, there was not one Bible verse in that 51-page document. That in and of itself ought to tell you something. You're trying to decide about morality and trying to decide what's right and what's wrong in a moral, and and so the 51 pages talking about tolerance and acceptance. but tolerance and acceptance is, uh, uh, has boundaries for all of us. Have no uh, fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness is what, is what the Bible says, but rather reprove them. But I think that's just typical of, of what happens, and we're looking at that Jewish nation whenever the priests scattered in, in, in cities all over here. I mean, you, you think about that. There are six cities of refuge, but, uh, but there are 48 cities that are Levitical cities, and they, were, they were, had the responsibility to make sure that the will of God was known. And it's important for us to, uh, to understand what happens whenever people get away from that. Uh, and it's happening, uh, it's happening in America. Situations come up, and the, and the message so many times that comes out of the pulpit is so positive. You know, it's like going to, and somebody will have to think with some more of the more common names, and I won't talk about uh, Norman Vincent Peale. Anybody ever remember him, How to Win Friends and Influence People? Was that, was that his? Or, I, was, did he write that? What, what was the book Peale wrote? I can't remember. I, I, you know, if I ever had it, I lost it. What was the name of it? Power of 
the power of positive thinking, and then seven steps to this and seven steps to that, and, and uh, how to win friends and influence people, and Zig Ziglar, and somebody else tell me one of the more modern names. It's just positive, positive, positive. And so you come to church and you get energized by positive thoughts. Well, there's energy that comes whenever we come to worship God, but sometimes it's because we have been reproved. And whenever we get away from, from this, kind of, this kind of situation, we get ourselves in a, in a real, real mess in relationship to this. Let, let, let me point out something in relation to this. And that is the, well, did I skip one of the slides about the fact God gave them all of the land? Yes, God kept His promise. Important. God had promised to give them to the land. And when you get to the end of the book of Joshua, and this, this is in chapter 21, the Lord gave to Israel all the land which He swore to give unto their fathers. One aspect of premillennialism is God never gave the land to the Jewish nation. Well, that's not what it says. Look at verse 43, verse 45. Not one word failed of any good thing the Lord has spoken to the house of Israel. It all came to pass. And so the Lord fulfilled His promise. I'm, go I'm going to give you this land. And so, so when they get in the land, God has kept His promise and they possess the land. And uh, they at times possess far more than this land. You get to the time when David's on the throne or, or Solomon's on the throne, you really get to a time that, that, is, that is really, really important in relationship to this. But I want us to talk about troubles that came. In, in, uh, in the book of Joshua, in chapter 22, those two and a half tribes that were on this side of the Jordan River, that's, that, that's Reuben and Gad and half of the tribe of Manasseh, they were over here in this land, and uh, they have sent their soldiers over, and in, if it was seven years, they've helped all of the Jews conquer all of this land, the 31 kings and all the battles that are there, and so now it's time for them to go back home. So these soldiers from, from two, two tribes and half of the tribe of Manasseh, they cross over the Jordan River, and when they get on the other side of the river, can you believe what happens? They arrived on the other side. You got your Bible? I can't believe what those people did. Look at verse 10. When they, when they came to the regions of, of, uh, of Jordan, uh, which is in the land of Canaan, the children of Reuben and the children of Gad and half the tribe of Manasseh built an altar there by the Jordan, a great impressive altar. That's pretty serious to do that. They already had an altar over there on the other side. They had the Ark of the Covenant. And so they, so they build this altar. Now the children of Israel uh, heard someone say, the children of Reuben and Gad and, the, and, uh, the, the, uh, and, and the half of the tribe of Manasseh have built an altar on the frontier of the land of Canaan in the region of the Jordan on the, on, uh, on the children of Israel's side. And when the children of Israel heard it, the whole congregation of Israel uh, gathered together at Shiloh to go to war against them. My, oh my, what kind of thing has developed? Well, we've had the altar that was built, and there is this angry confrontation. Aren't you glad there are folks that stand for truth? I mean, they hear these two and a half tribes over there, and man, have they done something really, really, really bad. They've built an altar over there on the other side. And so verse 13 says, And the children of Israel sent Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the priest, to the children of Reuben and the children of Gad and to half the tribe of, uh, uh, of Manasseh in the land of Gilead. And with him ten rulers, one from each of the chief houses of every tribe, and each one was the head of the house of his father among the children of Israel. And they came to the children of Reuben and Gad, to the children of Gad, to the uh, half-tribe of Manasseh in the land of Gilead. And they spoke to them, saying, Thus says the whole congregation of the Lord, You folks are doing wrong. It's important for us to stand and to do the right thing. And you have committed, uh, uh, what treacherous thing is this that you have committed to the against the God of Israel, to turn away this day from following the Lord, in that you've built for yourself an altar 
that you might rebel this day against the Lord. Boy, I'm telling you, it is so important for us to take a stand. And then they began to remind these individuals, would you read the Bible? Don't you know what's happened? And he says, don't you remember that, uh, uh, if the, do you not remember the iniquity of Peor? Was that not enough from, for, for us? from which we are not cleansed till this day, although there was a plague in the congregation of Israel. That doesn't mean anything to us. But there was that time whenever the children of Israel, even before Moses died, you remember that Balaam came over when the Israelites were encamped sort of in this area here, and Moses, uh, 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 well, the the Moabites, the Moabites ought to be on that that somewhere. Is that Moab? Is that uh, over in that area? And, uh, and they got Balaam to come over and curse them. You know what Balaam did? Balaam, or Balaam said, these people are God's people. You can just get them to sin. Everything will be all right. And so they got the children of God to commit fornication. Uh, Balaam's influence was such that, that he, uh, he, he got them to commit fornication. This is back when Moses was alive. And the end result was that... Uh, God sent us, was so angry at what happened that He sent a plague among them. And they, were, uh, and they were about, you see the tribe of Dan? You see where Dan is all the way up there? Dan almost had no possession. Dan just about ceased to exist as a tribe because God was wiping out all of those who had been involved in this immorality. And so these people say, Don't you remember what just happened just seven years ago to make up a number? Don't you remember what happened there? And he says, if you rebel today against the Lord, that tomorrow he will be angry with the whole congregation of Israel. You guys have not only endangered yourself. I read the latter part of verse 18. Nevertheless, if the land of your possession is unclean, then cross over to the land of the possession of the Lord, where the Lord's tabernacle stands and take possessions among us and do not rebel against the Lord, you guys, if, if, if you need to come back to God. You need, if you want to, you can come over on the West Bank. And we'll make provision for you to live over there with us because it's important to do what God says. We've got a serious problem, do we not? Look at verse 20. Did not Achan, the son of Zerah, commit a trespass in the accursed thing, and wrath fell on the congregation of Israel? And that man did not perish alone in his iniquity. They said, won't you look in the Bible? Won't you remember when over here at Jericho and Ai? Don't you remember how tragic it was and how when Achan had disobeyed God, his sin impacted everybody. We went up to take the city of Ai and we lost that battle. What on earth are you brethren doing? We ought to stand for God. Then the children of Reuben and the children of Gad, I'm reading verse 20, uh, pardon me, verse 21. Half the tribe of Manasseh answered and said to the heads of the division, The Lord God of gods. Jehovah, God of gods, He knows. And let Israel itself know, if it is in rebellion or in treachery against the Lord, do not save us this day. If what we have done is wrong, then may we come under the judgment of God. If we have built ourselves an altar to turn from following the Lord or to offer on it burnt offerings or grain offerings or to offer peace offerings on it, let the Lord Himself hold us accountable. If we are doing wrong, let God kill us. Then He says, But in fact, we have done it for fear. There's a reason why we've done this. In time to pass, in, in, uh, in time to come, verse 24, your descendants may speak to our descendants, saying, What have you to do with the God of Israel? For the Lord has made a border between you and us. You folks who are over there on that east bank, Reuben and Gad and, 
we know the half-tribe of Manasseh, you have no part in the Lord. So your descendants would make our descendants cease fearing God. What are they saying? They're saying, you need to understand that here we are over here on this bank. And there is that mighty Jordan River that separates us from you. And here's where the tabernacle is, and it will someday be in Jerusalem. They don't know that. But the time may come when your descendants will say to our descendants, you people are not a part of what we're trying to do here. You have no, no part in this land because the border is the Jordan River. Therefore we said, let us now prepare to build ourselves an altar. Now look at this. Not for burnt offerings, nor for sacrifice. Does this begin to change the, the picture of what, what's happening here? We have not built this altar that we might have another place to worship the God of heaven. But we've built it that it may be a witness between you and us and our generations, our descendants, your descendants, that we may perform the service of the Lord before Him with our burnt offerings and with our sacrifices and with our peace offerings, that your descendants may not say to our descendants in time to come, you have no part with us in the Lord. We have no intention for this altar that we've built over here on the East Bank to ever be a place of sacrifice. We have built this place so that our descendants and your descendants will remember that we are one nation. And that's why we have built this. Therefore we said that it will be when they say this to us or our generations in time to come that we may, may say... You know what we have here? We have a replica of the altars that our fathers made on the other side. And all to the Lord which our fathers made, though not for burnt offerings nor for sacrifice. But we've built this monument here as a witness that we ourselves have right to this land. And so now, this whole picture may take, this whole picture is changing. Before you make hasty judgments, you need to make sure you've got the whole picture. Sometimes churches have problems. Somebody says something and somebody else buys into it, and then all of a sudden the whole church is stirred up about it. And that's what happened here. I think this is an amazing story about how to handle problems. We need to take time enough to hear the full side. You and I need to understand there are two sides to every story. The Bible says, and you can paraphrase this as loosely as I, if a man speaks before, speaks before he knows the whole matter, you want to finish what, what, how the Lord feels about that? I won't say the word fool. I think that's what the Lord says. He's really stupid. <laughs> That's Dan's paraphrase. He's an idiot. And, and these individuals thought that they were doing the thing that was right. Far be it from us that we should rebel against the Lord. Verse 29. And turn from following the Lord this day to build an altar for burnt offerings, for grain offerings, or for sacrifices, besides the altar of the Lord our God, which is before His tabernacle. We have absolutely no intention of this altar ever being a substitute for what was on the other side. Now when Phinehas and the priest and, and, and the, the prince and the rulers of the congregation, the heads of the divisions of Israel who were with him, heard the words that the children of Reuben and the children of Gad and the children of Manasseh spoke, it pleased them. Sometimes when we speak before, the, before we know the whole matter, there are reasons that are not understood. And you and I have no right to judge the motive of somebody else. Judge not that you be not judged. You know what that says? 
I don't have any right to say, well, I know what she said, but let me tell you what she meant when she said what she said. Why? You don't know that. And, and the Bible says, judge according to, to appearance. We've got to have the fruit. By their fruits you shall know them. And agape love says, I don't ever have a right to say, well, I know what you said, but you know what you meant when you said what you said? Are you God? How do you know what that individual meant when they said what they said? That's what happened here. And when those two individuals sat down and talked about this matter, then Phinehas and the son of Elias and the priest said to the children of Reuben and Gad and the children of Manasseh, this day we perceive that, is that the Lord is among us because you have not committed this treachery against the Lord. We misjudge you. Well, how are you going to find out if you've misjudged somebody? If you have all against your brother, do what? Go talk to them by yourself. I'm having trouble with somebody in the church. Would you go with me? I just want you to be there when I go talk to them. It won't work. Well, I'm going to get two or three people to go with me. It won't work. You go by yourself alone. And the two of you sit there and try to work it out. That's what did not happen here. Once they finally got to the place where they could all sit down together. And that's why the Lord said, if you'll not hear you with, with, with by yourself, then take a witness or two with you. But I don't have a right ever to say, I know what you said, but I know exactly what you meant. You don't know that. There's no way you can know the intent of that person unless you're all the Almighty God. And so... Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the priest and the rulers, returned from the children of Reuben and the children of Gad, from the land of Gilead to the land of Canaan, to the children of Israel, and brought back words to them. So the thing pleased the children of Israel, and the children of Israel blessed God. They spoke no more about going to battle against them. When that peace has been restored, because we may have been misjudged, what's the application? You got marriage problems? Don't you go talk to your best friend. Unless that best friend happens to be your husband or your wife. <laughs> you don't go talk to somebody in the church. Well, would you tell me what I ought to do about this? Well, would you go with me? Let's go talk to them. No. Problems with your children? You may not know everything that's involved in the decisions that your children have made. And what a great, great lesson this chapter in Joshua chapter 22 is about solving problems. VBS next week, and then after that we'll have our final study of the book of Joshua. Thank you so much for the way you've listened.